بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبة فلا question was asked السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I hope you're doing well I had a question in regards to menhaj I've been aware of the Salafi Dawah for close to a decade and there is a question that's been on my mind in the West Many people are unaware of their deen in general due to the living and growing up here. Many don't pray, lack fiqh and deen, and have doubts. But when I speak with brothers regarding visiting other masajid to give talks to the youth, they mention to not sit and give talks in the masajid of bid'ah. They use as an evidence that this is from the menhaj of the salaf. Why are we using this from the menhaj of the Salaf? Why are we using the time of the Salaf to judge the modern world? During the time of the Salaf, Islam was strong. People knew their deen and knowledge was widespread. At the time of the Salaf, Muslims were not a minority living in majority Kafir, secular, liberal country. The Muslim youth in the West are dealing with major doubts and indulging in sins that have become widespread. The filth we have grown up in is so utterly different to what the early generations were exposed to, so I don't see why we are using the same principles of dealing with innovation like before. Lastly, since the Muslims are a minority in the West and are generally much more ignorant of their deen, I'm wondering where is the middle ground? I find it confusing that a brother will refuse to go to a mosque because the imam is an ashari, but most of the attendees are miskeen people that aren't aware of these things. If you know a book that goes into detail regarding this issue, I'd definitely be interested in learning more. So the question and comment and observation is very Uh, well put and articulated and also it offers quite a bit of insight and analysis and is definitely not something we can just talk about very briefly so those who wish to gain some insight then continue on to the rest of the video because it's going to take some time Uh, another point I want to mention is that we have talked about this issue extensively in countless videos whole videos that I mention about the issue specifically of speaking in the Masajid of Ahl al-Bid'ah, but we're going to try to really unpack your question. So first and foremost, Ahabati Filah, Wa Akhuna Fadl. You mentioned in the West, many people are unaware of their deen in general due to the living and growing up here. And you know, and as Muslim minorities and the Shubahat and the Shahwat, the doubts and the level of desires. And no doubt, our time is quite different than the Salaf. So I will uh, agree with you in that observation that the time we live in, 2024, is quite different than, uh, you know, 1400 years ago. And with that being the case, it requires looking in the context of our society and the context of our place, you know, where you reside. In fact, we can easily observe, and as I've mentioned countless times, where I'm living now is quite different than the Dow in Seattle, Washington. And the Dow in Seattle, Washington is very different than the Dow in L.A. And L.A. is quite different to the East Coast in general. And we're talking about North America only. Which New York is probably fairly different than Philly in that the level of students of knowledge that are exposed to the Dawah to Salafia, the general Muslim folk, uh, the generations of Muslims compared to the East Coast to the West Coast, also there's a gap there in general. So all of those things provide context for each of those environments. Now, we didn't talk about across the pond in Birmingham or London. Or Hull, England. Hull is different than London. Even though I've never been, but I have ties. I had ties to Hull, England. And that's quite different than I know than Croydon and Birmingham and 
the center of London, which is different than France, which is different than Nigeria, which is quite different than Ethiopia, which is different than the Tao in Indonesia, meaning that it requires context of those societies. Now, something where I would differ with your observation is when it comes to principles. The principles, we are always tied to what is known as Dalil Shari, Kitab, Wa Sunnah, Wa Ijma'a Salaf, Wa Qiyasu Sahih, sound analogy. So the Quran, the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, the consensus, and the sound analogy. All of those things, we call those maratib adilla. So we're never going to change our adilla. <clears throat> and when we don't have adilla for something, evidence for something, we rely on our scholars for fatwa from their ijtihadat, from their juristic reasoning, that they're looking into the kitab sunnah, making that analogy from two similar things or a similar context or a similar situation or from their ijtihad because there is no similarities, they're going to make ijtihad, but they are still making their ijtihad with the usul, the foundation of kitab sunnah wa fahma salaf salaf hadhi ummah. So they're still using that. And this is one of the things that Yasser Qadi made a mistake when he was mentioning, which is a little out of scope of what we're going to talk about. But this is one of the observations I spoke about in my PhD thesis about Dr. Qadi and some of his bid'ah and, and aberrations in departing from the Book and the Sunnah and the Minhaj of the Salaf of this Ummah. So those are all things we have to take into play. And so we don't ever depart that usul or that furur necessarily. Okay? Especially the usul. And the methodology of trying to attain that. So, for example, we don't now say, well, the modernist Sufis, an extremist progressive, they kind of have a new analysis because they are now talking about in the context of this time. So we can use their itch yet? No. Their usul is taban, it's tore up, so we don't even refer to them. We go to Ahl Sunnah, we explain the situation to Ahl Sunnah, A'immat Sunnah, not just anyone from Ahl Sunnah, and we rely and depend upon their ijtihad. And their ijtihad also takes into play a far'in, a, a which means part of making a ruling on something is that they have a correct understanding of the context. So if you say there's a guy in my city, his name is Yasser Qadi, you know, he uh, says dua to the dead is just a bid'ah, it's not kufr. Well, we have to be accurate in our description of this so-called individual named Yasser Qadi so we can give the sheikh the correct context of who this man is and, and his goal. Maybe this individual said this, but as far as the hukum on this individual, he's someone, he's a new Muslim. He became Muslim three days ago. And he said this because he heard it from someone else. Is the hukum on this individual the same as Dr. Qadi, who has immense amounts of studies, studied with scholars of Ahl Sunnah and scholars of Ahl Bidah, studied with, uh, in Yale, some of the finest secular universities, and was misled there, but that's outside of our scope. So the point being a habatifillah is all of those things need to be considered when looking at a mas'ala, and we're looking at a hukum on a person, or looking on this or that, or the ijtihadat. So when we're talking about different times and different contexts. The next point I want to address, and hopefully I didn't get too far off the topic, and if I did, hopefully at least it was beneficial, is the issue you mentioned, you say, when I mention to brothers to go address the youth, they say that, that we don't go to the masajid of Ahl al 
because the imam's in a, a mubtidiyah or something like this. And then when I ask them for adillah, they say it's the minhaj of the salaf. So first and foremost, when this general vague statement, this is the minhaj of the salaf, naam, it's from the usul of the minhaj of the salaf. But does that mean that we can just put these masail into computers and we just come out with this thing and it said, Imam Babahari said, and, and that's the hukum, um, that's it, it's over. There's no exceptions. Absolutely not. And that's why it's important to refer the issues to Ahl al-Ilm, not necessarily to the brothers, whoever the brothers are. I don't know who they are. They could be, some could be students, some could just be nice brothers who love students of knowledge, who are their friends and who sit with them and this and that and the other, and they're not even students. They're not even beginning students of knowledge, but they've already made a hukum. Don't go to this message. Don't go to that imam. So it's very important to ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So one of my pieces of research, I would say, or not a piece of research, but an issue I looked into when I lived in, last living in Medina, is I went <clears throat> to about seven different ulama from Ahlul Sunnah. And I'll name some of them because I can't recall everyone I went to. And the beautiful thing is I did record it. So one day I will release those recordings. From those scholars I went to, I asked my sheikh in Hail, Sheikh uh, Saeed bin Halal. I asked Sheikh Suleiman Rahili in Medina. I asked Sheikh, uh, uh, <coughs> Sheikh uh, uh, Ibrahim Rahili in Medina. I asked our Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab al Aqiyo, Rahmatullahi, Rahmatin Wasiya. I tried to ask Sheikh Obaid, but he was sick that day, and I, I remember distinctly going to his masjid. And I forgot the name of his neighborhood, but Abdullah Lahmami was his neighbor. But Sheikh Obeid was sick that day. And I remember him walking away because I said, I have a, a question. And they were taking him away for Asa or something back to his home. I asked Sheikh Abdullah Obeilan. So that's five. Uh, and, and I asked uh, Alama uh, Saudi Suhaimi this question. And I think I asked somebody else and I can't remember. I'll get my recordings one day if they're not destroyed. <clears throat> so I asked all of those Mashaikh the same issue. Every single one of those Mashaikh mention that in essence, I got to give you a malachis because they all gave beautiful, different details. I love it. And they all basically said, It is built upon the harms and the benefits. Now, some of the people say that's Mumayyad. That's, that's, you're throwing away the men of the salaf. And I would say to those people, you are throwing away intellect because you're not building your creed based on the book in the sunnah with the faham of the salaf of this ummah and the salaf of this ummah had fiqh deen. So I'd say, I'm not saying that you just have to use your intellect and you should just think about this. No, I'm saying go back to the madhab of the salaf. Go intricately into the madhab of the salaf and go to the ulama throughout history. And look at what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, because he will give you those beautiful fawaid and malachasat uh, masail. He'll, he'll just get into those issues and give you the summary and give you the khalasa taqol and manakashat and just beautiful debates and looking into things intricately. And likewise, Shaykh al-Islam uh, ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah jami'an. So all of those scholars, as I said, they mentioned that these issues depend on harms and benefits. And I'll give you some of the details of Sheikh Suleiman or Ali because he kind of gave some nice details. One of the things I remember <coughs> from Sheikh Suleiman is he said that if you go to a masjid of Ahl al-Bidah, meaning that it's not tahrim, a, 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 a it's not something that's haram, you can't say that. And I'll give you some delil. Because those people didn't give you delil. They said it's the minhaj of the self. I'm going to give you delil from the son of the Prophet wasallam. So Sheikh Suleiman, and I'll give that from what Sheikh Ibrahim Rahali said to me. So Sheikh Suleiman Rahali said that one of the things that's important, if you do, so meaning it's not prohibited, but if you see as a talib al-ilm or ahl al-ilm, not just the general Muslim, but someone who's a person of knowledge, who has studied Allah's deen and atlub al-ilm al-idea al-ulama, they study with the ulama and what have you, and they see that there's a greater benefit than a harm by giving this lecture at a masjid of ahl al-bid'ah, then 
he advised because he added his advice in there with that that itch. This is his itch had here, and I and I agree, and I think it's a great point he makes. Sheikhana, half of the Taala, <clears throat> is he said that when you go, if you do end up going, he said make shura or consult your Salafi brothers in that area, so that way <coughs> they don't get ideas <coughs> that you are now with the people of Bid'ah and, you know, causing confusion that the people have swelled the ranks with a famous person from Ahl Sunnah to make it seem like they're from Ahl Sunnah. So he said that you should make, you know, you should consult your brothers in there. So that was beautiful advice. Doesn't mean you have to with this wajib. No, no, you can't say that. But it's a good, valuable uh, piece of advice that our Sheikh gave in this issue as a detail that make sure your Salafi brothers around there, at least some du'at, of Ahl Sunnah, they kind of understand. Hey, Achi, Ikhwa in this area that are thought of the ilm. I've been invited to go to this uh, Ashri Masjid. They invited me to speak without any restraints and restrictions. That was one of the things also a lot of the ulama mentioned. As long as there's no shurut or conditions, no, you can't speak about Tawheed. No, you can't speak about this. No, you can't speak about that. Okay, if the people of Bid'ah are saying that, then no, don't don't go. It's better not to because you're just you're just giving them what they feel. You're not dealing with their bid'ah. You're not addressing their innovation and what have you. And most of the time, the people of bid'ah, maybe some of the hizbi, ikhwani, might allow you, maybe. But usually, Ashadis, no. And others uh, that are Sufi and you know have totally different creeds entirely, usually they're not going to allow that. <clears throat> but if they do, again, it, it depends on the harms and the benefits. Weigh those harms and benefits. And consult with your brothers. I think that's a good uh, thing. And I don't know all the details with our brother Abu Taymiyyah, but I know Allah has favored him with a, a loud voice, meaning he is able to reach many people. A lot of people of Bid'a love him. And a lot of people, of, some of the people of Sunnah, they love him. And some of the people complain about him. Oh, he's going to this mission. He's calling to Allah. Is, is he compromising? Is it's not, he's changing his speech. He's not, he's not calling to Tawheed. He's not calling to the Sunnah. Is he calling to Bid'ah now? Okay. Those are where you, you need to look at when you're making this analysis and a hukum on this brother. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just giving that as a contemporary example in our community. So it's very important to look at these Masail Shaman. With completeness, not with foolishness, not with whims. Uh, a point that Sheikh Ibrahim al Haili he hit hard because a lot of the Mashaikh they gave me these beautiful conditions. Even Alama Saadi Suhaimi, I can't remember what he said, but I have it recorded <clears throat> somewhere. And a lot of the Mashaikh they gave some beautiful tafsilat details and stuff. Sheikh Ibrahim just smacked the issue right on his head. I said, Sheikh. Some of our Salafi scholars, they say, don't go to the Masajid of Ahl to give da'wah. And I, I know there's ikhtilaf bayn ulama'ina. Some of our ulama say it's okay with conditions. You know, that is for sure. And Sheikh Ibrahim, it's like he stopped me in my tracks. He just said, oh, hold up. He said, he said, it really doesn't matter what any of them say. And what he was saying was true. He said, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, said, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, if one person is guided by your hand, it is better for you than the red camels. <clears throat> that's what, that's exactly what she, I'll never forget this. Maybe I'll carry that with to my grave. I'll never forget that. Because he didn't go into all those Messiah of this, it, you know, Maslahawa, Mafsada, la, he slapped it in the face with a dillag, shqawiya, jiddan. You can't dispute that. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever guides a person, it is, it's better for him than the red camels. So he said, it doesn't matter what the people said. I, and I love that. Because think about it. We're ordered to give da'wah to the non-Muslims. They believe, some people believe in rocks and frogs and turtles and spiders and grasshoppers they worship. And people worship dog doo-doo, everything. Rats. And you're telling me you can't go to an Ikhwani? You can't go to a Sufi if they if they allow you to speak there without any compromise? Trust me, 
I, when I would have to pray in the Dio Bundy's Masjid back in my city where I was raised in, because most of the Masajid there are Dio Bundy and they're oriented that way. <clears throat> so I'd pray my, you know, my, a couple of my salats there daily because there was no, there wasn't even a Khwani Masjid around. Those guys got that area sewed up. Like several massages in that air, in those areas. So when I would pray there, if they would have allowed me to even read Riyadh Salihin with them, meaning I'm the reader, not you guys, not most, all those guys who are awam anyway. They're just regular guys who are part of the jama'ah. None of them is sought knowledge except for their imam. If they would have allowed me, they never would. We gave salams. But they would never uh, allow me to, to speak in their masjid. And I would never stick around for what they have to say. But if they had allowed me one time, I would have given it everything I could from the knowledge that I have to share with them, calling them to the sunnah. And then maybe they would have allowed me to do it more often. Not to become their jama'ah, but no. I'm out, uh, in a position now to share knowledge with them. So hopefully, <clears throat> what I've already kind of answered, kind of deals with this issue, because you bring a lot of other important details, but I think we've already kind of dealt with the overall answer, in that no doubt Salafi scholars have difference of opinion, and usually those ones <clears throat> who disagree with going to the Masajid of Ahl Bidah, that even them, if you were to press Sheikh Obeid, Allah Yarhamahu, uh, Sheikh Rabi is still alive, but he is elderly, elderly, like, you know, I don't think he, <clears throat> you know, for those Mashaikh that have a very stern position, that even they would say that it it's built upon Musadi wa Mufasid. But one of the things, they try to close that door, and I firmly believe this, and I'll give you one Dalil, that it's not just my opinion. Let me give you a Dalil for you people who are extreme and want to say, oh, he's Mumayya, and he's saying about the sheikh, I'm going to give you some heavyweight delil for you and make you sit on it. <clears throat> um, that one of the things we have to look at is we have to look at that, looking at the harms and benefits. But their argument generally is that you're going to make the ranks of Ahl Bidah bigger. Okay, if you do that, you're going to make the ranks of Ahl Bida bigger, bigger. When we look at what, when we go into the books, I have them. You can see some of them in the back. I do have them. So we could go deep into this mess if we wanted to, but I, I don't, I'm comfortable because I already know what I asked, what I heard, what I studied. I already know. And I, I have the books and I went through these issues many times. So you need to go study it and look it up and feel comfortable. <clears throat> but Generally, their argument is because they feel like you're, you're, you're swelling the ranks of Ahl Bidah. So don't do it for that reason. And we know Mashaikh and, and the, some of the Kalam that used to be in Medina, some of the Mashaikh would kind of say, well, Sheikh Abdul Razak, he goes to these certain people and he goes to this. He is also a person of knowledge. And Sheikh Ubaid would even say, Lakin huwa ma'na. Like he, he's, he's from Ahl Sunnah. We don't have any issue with him. We may not agree with the fact he's going there. But the sheikh sees it differently. And so many mashayikh in their practice, they may do that. Great imams like, <clears throat> well, we said Sheikh Abdul Razak, Imam Fozan, many great scholars. It's not like their audience is only Salafi. They're calling people to the menhaj of the Salaf. That's the whole point of the dawah. So why you would cut off, if you're in a position of power, you're the one giving the lecture, why would you cut that off? We should be more open to pushing that forward. Oh, you're going to let us go speak to you? We're on it. We're going to call you to the Kitab wa Sunnah. As long as we're not compromising. So this is one of the issues that unfortunately, I think many people don't understand. And I think some people who do understand, I don't know if they just prohibit the knowledge or they're kind of like so stern and staunch in their position. They just don't want to acquiesce <clears throat> because they don't want to seem weak, they don't want to seem mumay. You know, I don't know. There's, I think there's a lot of reasons for that without probing into the hearts of some of the people. <coughs> so those are very important things. Now, let's get to that claim. Khalid Green made a claim. Well, I even taught, it's on this YouTube channel, a short treatise that 
Sheikh Rabi, Hafiz Allah Ta'ala, wrote. And guess what Sheikh Rabi did? He went to Sudan. And guess what Sheikh Rabi did? He gave da'wah to Sufis. Can you believe that? It's Khalid Green lying. You look it up. Because I'm not going to dig out the trees. But it's well known. You can find it translated in English because I was using the English copy. <clears throat> and he went to the Sufis in their masjid. Why? Because he is an imam. He knows his deen. And he had the majal. He had the opening. He said, oh, to his to Sudanese Salafis there saying, hey, you know, Sheikh, that masjid is this. Oh, okay. Let me go there and talk to them. They'll let me talk. Okay. And he spoke. So understand, we shouldn't close the door based on our desires and a lack of knowledge. Rather, we should open the doors based on knowledge and looking at the harms and the benefits and looking really at what the statements of the ulama say and more importantly, what the Kitab al Sunnah says. As our Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim Raheli pointed and really squashed the whole issue because the issue, all these other things are just fruits of what I'm talking about. But the Sheikh just said, well, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man yahdi Allah, Lian yahdi Allahu bika rajalin wahidin. If one person is guided by your hands, it's better than you for the, than the red camels, which was one of the most prized pieces of wealth of the Arabs. What's greater than that? Meaning if you have, you've guided someone to Islam or to the Sunnah, you've guided a Mubtadiyah, he's come to the Sunnah, he's come back, he said, man, I, I like you as a Salafi, you seem a little nicer. You're not biting me. And I think what you're saying is, is haq. You know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm moving away from this tasawwuf. I'm moving away from this other bid'ah that I'm on. The, guy, the, the, the blessing that you're going to get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than all the praise of the people and all the radud that the people put on you, against you, because, you, <clears throat> because they think you compromise, but yet this guy was guided to the sunnah and you're still on the sunnah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that I said was incorrect was surely from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad.